But it turns out the way space can do it is both sort of beautifully complex, but not that hard to explain. It's something that's often misrepresented. I'm going to tell you the two words I don't want to ever hear you use to talk about snakes in just a minute. Um, but to explain how they do it, we have to explain just a little bit about snake anatomy. So this is a skull of a ball on the right. That's a diagram I'm going to explain to you just a minute on the left. So here's a skull. These are the lower jaws. And the first thing you notice about them is they are not connected with the front. So if you put your finger against your chin right here, so put your chin, put your finger here. Feel this little dimple? A few of us here are old enough to remember an actor named Kirk Douglas. Remember how he had a big cleft in his chin? So his, his mandibular symphysis is visible on the outside. That little, that little groove between two bumps is, is the bony joint that forms when you're developing as an embryo. Okay? And that never happens in snakes. So the two halves of our lower jaw are completely independent. The second thing is, our lower jaws connect to our skulls. They articulate with our skulls. So if you put your fingers on this side of your face and open your jaws, you can feel, feel your temporal mandibular joint working there, right? In snakes, there's an extra bone, sometimes two extra bones, that the lower jaw is suspended from. And that gives it an additional gain that I'll show you in just a minute. The last part that's a little harder to explain, but so I have this drawing over here, looks like a lot of teeth up here, okay? On our upper jaw, we have one continuous row of teeth across here. It's actually two bones, a right and a left, left maxillary bone. In snakes, this is just one half over here. This is the right arch. There's, here's a maxillary bone, then there's these other rows of teeth in the middle. And the whole thing, the whole upper jaw is sort of shaped like a tuning fork. This being the handle, and these being the two arms of the fork. And this right here is in the mouth of the snake. So if we actually looked in the roof of the mouth of the snake, we'd see these two tuning forks with two rows of teeth. And they're movably attached so they can go back and forth like this. Okay? It's crazy. That's what all these teeth are. So how are you going to explain how this works? Well, a long time ago, now, when I was teaching natural history at Berkeley, I invented a way to teach how snakes eat. Uh, and it's one that uses your own body as a model. And it's a lot of fun. You can get six-year-olds to do this. So I've had whole classes of little kindergarten kids acting like snake heads. Okay? And I did this for like 30 years, and there was always a missing piece of the puzzle, which I'll explain to you in just a second. And so just a couple of years ago, I went to a Montessori school in Houston, and I got these nine-year-olds to help me figure out how to do it better. Okay? And there's a YouTube video of this. It's really wonderful of uh, Sadie and her friends teaching me how to teach better. But basically, if you clasp your hands like this, Okay, hold them like this. Now we're going to imagine we're a lizard. And our, L, our, our, lower, our forearms are the lower jaws of a lizard. So when the lizard opens its mouth, its mouth opens like this. Okay? <coughs> yeah, okay? So that's a lizard. Now if, it, if, if it's a snake, first of all, the, the joint doesn't form. So now its lower jaws can work apart, right? And it's suspended on each side of the skull by this strut. Okay? Now, see how much bigger it can open? So if it's a lizard of a certain head size, it can only open this big, and any food it swallows has to go through this hole right here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? So if it's a lizard, it eats like this, this is the lower jaw, this is the head. Okay? And if it's a snake of the same head size, it can get this big. So now you can have a hole this big instead of a hole like this triangle. And that's basically how snakes can swallow such big things. So I figure this out, and for 30 years I teach like this in my classes. I do outreach for kids like this. I explain it. It's a lot of fun to get 26-year-olds all going like this and feeling their chins. It's even more fun actually to get a room full of grown-ups and convince them <laughs> to do things like this. Some are a little bit slow to react when you're teaching to them. But, uh, but I was always wondering, what about the upper jaws? You know, because I couldn't, I've only got two arms, you know, what do I do? So, I went to this Montessori class, and I told them my way, and then I asked these kids to help me figure it out. And there were various ways they talked about it, but the one that finally worked was for two kids, one to stand behind the other. And so two, these two girls, Sadie, and I think her name is Christy, she's the lower jaws, and she's the upper jaws. And you have to watch the, the YouTube video to really see it. But when they got in sync, Sadie the upper jaws, and so what a snake does, it, it basically hand over hand walks its jaws over that big food item. It doesn't, that bow wasn't going to pull the deer into it. It was going to walk its head around the deer. Okay? And it does it by first all the bones on the left side opening and going forward, 
And as the upper and lower jaws on the left close and start to pull back, the ones on the right are opening and going forward, okay? So it's like this, it's, it's hand over hand, but it's not just two hands, it's upper and lower, upper and lower. And these two little girls do a great job. Okay? So that's how it is, a snake can eat such a big meal, and that's why a snake can get by having maybe three to five meals a year, which completely changes its whole sort of natural history routine.